Back in the 60s and 70s, we had a lot of fires. Because of this fire bombing situation? Yeah, the, uh, and there was a lot of uh, arson fires in those mm -hmm. days. There was a lot of uh, malicious fires. Kids would set, if you had a vacant house in Woburn, the kids would set that every Friday and Saturday night until they burnt it to the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. Up in North Woburn, where the industrial park is now, that was all piggeries when I first went on. And when they were developing that, they, uh, there was a lot of vacant property up there that we had a lot of fires in. It was good training for the young guys coming on, you know, right. to get a vacant house and, and to get them in there and show them what it was like. Right. What, do, what is it that you remember about, is it from a firefighter's perspective, on those fire bombings? They were crazy. <coughs> no, we mm -hmm. couldn't catch them. <laughs> they'd light a fire someplace, mm -hmm. and then they'd go to the other side of town and light another one, so you never know where you're going to end up. You're back and forth. You're all over the place, you know? Mm -hmm. One night, well, that's when we used to start, like eight in the morning to six at night, and then six at night to eight in the morning. I went in, I was, we were on the rescue, John Matheson and myself, and we went to work at six, and then not too long after that, they got a call for fire down Woburn Square. Mm -hmm. That was the first one. They had 13 fires before the night was over. So it was a lot different then, and uh, we had, uh, they were burning Woburn Center with the riots that they had. In the 70s, They were right. burning North Woburn. Mm -hmm. um, just fire after fire. On a, we could go to work on a Friday night, and we knew we were going to have a fire somewhere. And, of course, we had Barker Lumber. We had Jaquitz. Mm -hmm. We had all those fires in the South End and in North Woburn. Car fires today, you get almost none unless it's on 93. Back then, they were burning cars all the time for really? either st stealing them and burning them, or people couldn't afford the insurance or the, what, the, to pay them payments, so they would burn the car to get the insurance, I should say. Well, <clears throat> first off, it got so bad that they had to, the rescue, which I was on at the time, and uh, they had it plugged into the city hall. Because we get two or three multiple alarms, sometimes a night. A night. You know? So we, the rescue truck was parked up, up beside City Hall, plugged into City Hall. And we lived on it, you know, during the night. During the day, we'd get back to our station. But, mm -hmm. uh, it was hectic. Well, so, most of the time, uh, up behind Jake Woods on Hunt mm -hmm. High Street, Prospect Street, behind there, there was a abandoned, pro abandoned property up there, sheds, buildings, small buildings. They'd be down there torching something there. And then, you, you know, you get a call for up in North Woburn up down the end of Merrimack Street and the Boston Street. The, the old buildings were up there. Uh, it just went, you'd, 1970 was a tough time because, you know, being on the fire service, we weren't used to that many different type of calls as far as going all from one call to another to another. It wasn't unusual. Like you get a call from the South End, then you get a call up to North Woburn, then you get a call down to, over there in the end of uh, Union Street or Campbell Street for outside the building, a fire. We were just very, you, you, you couldn't understand what was going on and why, why this was happening. Another big fire they had over here on the west side was Mayflower Furniture. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tommy Porter, uh, Billy Sweeney Sr., and myself, we had a line in the back end of the building and we're working it into the building, getting the fire down. They decided to open up deck guns and everything else in the front. And I don't know, one of the two of them said, drop the line and get going. And we just made it out the back door and the fire followed us out the door because they were pushing everything right through the building. You know? Wow. As we were walking up the front stairs of the cement on the grounds, we seen a glow in the, inside the building, and now we seen the window open, and they threw a Molotov cocktail in between a piano and an interior wall, and it just went straight up. And uh, I ended up with, in the attic with uh, Captain McManus. He was a private at the time, and a fellow named Norm Smith. Oh, yeah, I have, we have some nice Norm. photos of him, yeah. And we had a two and a half inch line up the uh, attic stairs and an inch and a half line, and we couldn't dent it. We just, it just wouldn't go out, you know? And I think Wendell Tebbets and Billy Dunahoo were in the snorkel, and they had the slate roof, and you, you couldn't get on it, you know? And they were whacking at the slate, and 
with the axes and everything. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever get hurt? Uh, a couple of times. Yeah, I got my uh, kids in North Wilburn were setting a lot of buildings five day years ago. In the 70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down from the North Wilburn Fire Station down around the corner. Two of us in the truck and I looked into the building and the guy I was, was with went around back and I'm on the side of the building. I see one fire here, one fire there. So I took the water from the hose, put it in the first fire and knocked it down and turned around the second fire and the thing blew back at me like that in my eyes. So I had to drop everything. I couldn't see. You, right? It happened so fast, just like that. Just yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Did, who came to your aid? Who helped you out? He helped well, you out around the, No, he patting around the... He was around the back of the building. I'd scream for him. Mm -hmm. I worked with Donnie when they first got the uh, rescue truck, the big rescue truck that they had. And when they opened the North Woburn Station, that was the truck they sent up there because the kids had been breaking in, breaking stuff in the building. It hadn't been accepted by the city yet. So we got shipped up there. And we were back in the boiler room, checking the boiler out and everything, checking to see what the building looked like. And we hear an awful banging on the front door. So we go up to the front door, and we open the door, and the guy says, the house across the street's on fire. So we drove the truck straight across Main Street, stopped, got the hose out, put the fire out. The kid had the whole side of the house going. It was a young kid that lived there. He ended up lighting about five fires around North Woburn. You know, the North Woburn machine and a couple of other ones up there. Uh, I guess they finally moved out of there. I don't know if he lit any fires later on, but that was funny because it was just drive straight across and stop. Hit the, the closest fire out, guy. Put it in reverse and back right back in the door. <laughs>One of the fondest memories I have, I think, was was, was gratifying was the, uh, we had a call up on Church Street, a woman in labor about to give birth, and it was it was in the winter time. It was cold, and, and we got to the scene, and, the, and she was in heavy labor. Uh, and of course, at the time we didn't know it that as far as she had a, it was going to be a breech birth, we couldn't move her. We were stuck at the house for. Trying to, trying to figure out what to do next. I remember calling the Chode Hospital and speaking to a nurse or a doctor up there and asking them, and they said, don't move her if, she, if, if, the, if there was a presentation of the, of the birth. So we waited long enough and we had coverage in the woman, you know, trying to be as helpful as we could. And finally she delivered at the house. Oh. So we, we delivered the little baby that girl That was there. tough. Yes, it was. It was. And it was a baby what? Baby girl. Baby girl. A baby girl. I remember that, yeah. She didn't name her Lonnie or anything. No, she didn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very gratifying. I mean, there was four of us there, two from the ambulance and two from the engine were there, and we're all trying to, we're all kind of nervous and trying to figure out what to do. I was the only one at the time with children at the time, and I had gone through childbirth with lessons with my own kids, so I was kind of, I was supposed to be you a pro. The, you were the I was the old experienced guy. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. But it was, it was great. Everything turned out great. An old farmer was doing us a brush, and... His clothes caught on fire and killed killed him. When we got there, I, I thought it was just a brush fire, but it was a, it was a pile of clothes with, with a person in it. In the city of Woburn, we uh, we have an old quarry down the end of Garfield Avenue, and we always kind of worried about that. And uh, so a couple of the firefighters, Johnny Sullivan and Jimmy McLaughlin, came to me and asked if they could get involved in rope rescue. And we went up and we practiced a lot of time up on the uh, Blueberry Hill Road over the cliff. And this one afternoon we got a call that there was three boys, I believe, climbing up from the bottom. And one of the boys was stuck and he couldn't get down. So uh, as we had trained, we went up there and we tied the ropes off. And then uh, Jimmy and Johnny settled and actually went over the cliff and Johnny grabbed the boy. And then we were able to haul him back up. Johnny Sullivan received the uh, Firefighter of the Year Award for that rescue. I got a call to go up to a house next to Danny Hogan's house on Wyman Street. They said a, a child fell in a cesspool. I says, oh, geez, so I'm all alone. The, the engine three was out somewhere. 
So I get up there, and sure enough, there's this kid that was a, an old, was dried out cesspool there. You know, and the kid's down there crying, his mother is panicking. They live right next to Stuart at Danny Hogan. So I said, there's only one way to do this, so I jump in, and I got the kid, and uh, that Earl Gonzales, he was a cop on patrol, he was the second one there. And so I just passed the child up to, to him, and then Freddie Dowd showed up, and they got a ladder down to me. <laughs> You better go home and take a shower and change your clothes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was working at Engine 318 and, I, and it was like wee hours of the morning. Of course, on the desk it was phone calls all night long. So I was just, just there. I heard it. I used to hear it. I was upstairs and I, I heard the door bang and then the lights come on in the station. And some talking downstairs. Charlie McGovern was on the desk. He was oh. running around to the front door. I'm upstairs. Oh. And I hear, I hear him going. Charlie's going, what? You're kidding. Just a minute. He wanted to run back and call the police. It was a guy stopped out front of the station in his yeah. car, and he said, "I just hit somebody up on 128," and he said, "And I think he's on the roof of my car," <laughs> and he was. He hit him going 65, and the guy landed, and he went up, and he got stuck on the roof of his car somehow. Whether I don't know, it was up there, but he got stuck. So Charlie's on the on the intercom. Get down here right away. <laughs> so. Eddie McManus and I got asked there, and sure was. He was up on the roof of the car. And I can tell you on an on a, on a ambulance one, that when I was on the ambulance with Steve McDonough, that uh, was was kind of funny. We had a call to East Woodward. I won't get the name of the street, but the uh, we got a call over, and he says, oh, my wife, I don't know if she took some uh, pills or something or whatever, but she passed out, but she was not passed out when we get there, so... He says, uh, by the way, he says, she has no clothes on. So Steve McDonough and I, we were just going to take the sheet, the blanket that she was under, and just put it on a stretcher and take her up the choke there with the guys. No, he says, she has no clothes. He rips the blanket right off. <laughs> and John McAllister and, and, and oh. Bob Perry, they were there too. They go, wow. You know? But we were on the air with Steve, and I said, oh, shit. Not a stitch. <laughs> Do you rescue many animals also? <laughs> I've never had to. You never had to, Joe? You never rescued a cat? No. no. I can't believe that. No, never did. <laughs> <Well, it> was... <laughs> they told us don't bother. Let him get up there, let him get down by himself. <laughs> well, when I started, I did go on a call for, for a cat. You did. This is back, back in 1970, 71, it was a call. And I remember it was, a, it was over there, it was on Maple Avenue, and it was a, an elderly woman, and a, the cat was up in the tree. So... I, I think I was with Frank McManus. You know, I might have been with Tommy White. But anyways, we put the ladder up to the tree and went up there with the damn cat. With <laughs> more claws going at me, trying to keep me from stopping to grab it. So we did get the cat down. You but did? I, I did. But I mean, I remember after that, not too long after that, they stopped doing that because they found out that they said, you know, leave the cat alone, it'll come down. And somebody else, uh, one of the other firefighters said that you never see a skeleton of a cat in a tree. <laughs> So I just backed up across on the street and jumped on the truck with Jerry Gaynor and uh, Sticks Quigley and went down to it. And uh, it was Napa. They, they used Napa to degrease the high. And they torched it off. So of course the fire burnt along the river. Well, when it hit the Napa, that shot back up that river and lit the railroad bridge on fire on Grape Street. And it came right back to the plant. That's what he heard was the explosion. So we were in there and the fire was in the cell, so we are trying to break up on the floor. And we are in front of one of the cookers that they had there, and boy, that cooker blew. And it was Jim McGowan, Billy Donahue, Stick Squiggly, and myself got blown. Yeah, it was just a push. big ball of flame and, and we got blown. I, I ended up on my back and I, I don't know, I, you didn't think of nothing. I know, I am, I and Lungs McGann grabbed me by the neck and dragged me out the door, I know that much. Wow. Because he just kept saying, breathe, breathe. <laughs> so I kept breathing, he told me to. <laughs> I was in that one up at um, Stafford Chemical when, when it was the, they made the tomato bowl sale with Lonnie. <clears throat> and Eddie McMahon said, if you, you and Lonnie try to get in and see if you can open up the big steel doors, you know, to get, so we can all get in. And uh, get some ventilation in there. When we went in, we had two axes. And I never forgot it. I took the one I had, and, and we 
got the big steel doors open, not the ones to the outside, but the interior doors. Put an axe on the floor and go in and hit it with the other one. So, so we could, you know, keep the yeah. door open. Then we went further. We had to take the one he had and put it under another door. Mm -hmm. And we get in the where the doors were, and they were the type with the chain that went all the way around the whole thing, oh, and yeah. it had a lock and a padlock on it too. We didn't have anything else, so when we turned around and go back out, now it was full of smoke, and um, the axe handles had burnt and the doors had closed, and we couldn't find our way out. And I looked at him and I said, this is a hell of a place to, to go on Christmas Eve. Oh, I know. It? And Donnie Foley that heard us banging on the doors, Lonnie and I. And then they came and Eddie Perry had a, they had a cutting torch on the rescue truck and they mm. cut a hole in it. And he passed in the bolt cutters and we cut the locks and opened the doors. I'd like to talk about a couple of fires if I could. I, and I think you might have all been there. And it's the first, that hazmat fire where, you know, so many firefighters did get hurt. It was the first you know, um, hazardous material fire, CVD. We get a call for, uh, uh, I think they said an explosion, something in a building, and it was an explosion. And uh, I was the second truck in, I was with uh, Mike Hennessy, uh, Joe Dooley, Bob McDowell, and someone else was on engine three. They, they arrived there before we did. And uh, when we got there, of course, everyone's out on the street there, but, uh, they opened the door and it was like orange smoke, you know, brownish orange smoke coming out the door. And right away, three of them went down. Okay. Fell to the ground. Went right down, yeah. They rushed them right out with the ambulance. There was poisonous gases in there. What happened? A, a fitting on, an oct on a hydrogen tank let go. And when the fitting let go, uh, it was a stainless steel cable mm -hmm. that spun around because of the gas coming out and it uh, broke the the fitting on a uh, and I can't remember the name of the gas now but it was a very toxic gas. Mm -hmm. uh, we put squad packs on we get in there and you know no fire to be seen uh, but it was that very smoky orange uh, actually our underwear was orange so we had a tour of the thing where we had on <clears throat> but as the guys came you know, it got worse and worse and worse, but fortunately I had a squad on, and uh, Hennessy was putting his on. He went down. Uh, <clears throat> Jackie Cormier came from the west side. They started putting a hazmat suit on him. He went down. Next thing we know, we only have the, I don't know, what do we have, 12 or 13 guys in the shift at the mm -hmm. time. And uh, next thing they were all down. So, uh, this Ronnie Finn, he, went down to help out at the desk. They knew it was a bad situation. And he called, he says, anyone here? So I says, yeah, he says, it's uh, engine four, it's tough as he goes. Jack, he says, you need any more trucks up there? I said, no, we don't need trucks. I says, there's only two guys <laughs> and seven trucks. We need men. <laughs> so he turned around, he says, okay, so I'll see what I can do. So they started calling everybody back. And of course they struck second and third lines and all that. And you know, they brought a lot of communities in right to the fire. So that, then it cleared a little bit. And, and I remember Stevie Patterson, he was one of the guys that came back. And uh, Dave Lilly and I, we was the only one left on the shift. Uh, but Stevie Patterson and I, we found the, the tank after it cleared a little bit. And, and by that time, Bob Doherty, he was at a meeting in town, so he got the other thing. I know what the tank is. He says, he says yeah, don't bring it out the front door. So, Stevie Patterson and I took the tank out. Everybody did the right thing. They had their gear on, they had their mask on, but what happened when they were coming out to change their tanks, the gas had got in their clothing. So when they took the mask off, they started breathing the gas. Oh, wow. Well, hydrogen and selenite, if I remember what it was, is very, very dangerous. And the, about eight guys, oh, Stevie had day, he was there, they all was up at the Child Hospital. You know, they admitted them. For a few days. And you were all contaminated at this point. It was all contaminated. So, of course, we were all out for at least five or six weeks. And every week we had to go back, sometimes twice a week, to get checked out. Timmy Green, I remember seeing him up there, and every week, no, you guys ain't going. So they had to cover a whole shift for five weeks. Really? They took all our turnout gear, you know, the firefighting gear. Any clothes we had, throw them away, you know, underneath. And we ended up with all 18 in the hospital on that group uh, that was working that day in that group. And one firefighter, uh, Joe Dooley, never came back to work. Uh, he uh, got reactive lung disease from that. Really? And never came back to work. Being 
on a roof at night in the dark um, above a burning building and having the wind change or whatever the conditions change and the smoke condition come to where you can't see anything and you're on the roof, of course it goes through your mind, are we going to get off the roof? Or are we going to go through the roof? Or um, that sort of thing. And also being in a burning building, with, contrary to what you see on TV, in burning buildings you don't see anything. Once there's a little water on the fire or even before, visibility is zero. But there's one fire on uh, Man's Court that I remember, and probably my first working fire. I was going to say, recall. what was your first experience? Really work fire with fire coming out the third, second and third floor. And I put the gear on and run up the street, and Bob Perry was there, and he says, you come with me. So we went in the side window, and he uh, just said, keep going, keep going. And, and again, going back to when there was no breathing apparatus in those days, right. the ones they had, they didn't even bother wearing because they, didn't, they, weren't, they were worthless. I had little canisters in front of them type of thing with a mask. So anyways, there were no masks. And if you've never been in a fire, the thing that really affects me the most, and I think probably most people on the average, some guys, as we used to say, could eat the smoke. But it would choke you up pretty good, but your eyes would go. Your eyes would just completely start burning. And when you couldn't see, your eyes were watering so bad. So it was very difficult in those days. You'd have the holes in front of you and you'd be splashing the water on your face to keep the, the smoke out of your eyes and do what you could do. And Again, in a fire, it's complete darkness. You can't see where you are, but mm -hmm. Bob Perry was just pushing me along on the hose. Finally, in the end, the fire gets knocked down, and that was my first fire. Carolina Terrace. Tell us about that fire. Uh, it was a cellar fire, and it was uh, well beyond its stage. And uh, I think I went to two, two alarms. And uh, we come out of East Woburn, and we get into the cellar. It was. Because we none of us put a mask on, because we thought we could knock it down in a hurry, and uh, it was possibly two rooms, maybe three, mm -hmm. in the cellar. It was all finished, and uh, we sort of nailed it. We opened up the roof and uh, we got it nailed. Was it a situation going into a cellar is different than attacking it from the cellar? Fires are tough. There's no place for it to go but right at you. So Simple house fire is the worst. I mean, you can, you can go to a large Murray's shop, uh, but you're just banging it from the outside. You, uh, you know, surround and drown, something like that. Protect the exposures. But your you, attic fires are tough. If you don't get it open in time, you gotta get that roof over. We got a call one, one night, right around the corner behind the Dairy Queen, Billy Budrow lived in the place and he had a room on the second floor in the back and there was a fire escape right outside his window just the ladder mm -hmm. and Billy was down at the sidewalk and he's hollering there's a guy up there I said where so we run up around the back and I run up around the back of the building with him and he says up in there he says you gotta go through my room so I jumped up Went up the fire escape, got in <laughs> Billy's room, got out into a, a hallway, and Billy's door closed behind me and locked. So now I'm up the creek, I can't get back out his window. And I could hear a moan. I couldn't see anything, so I just started feeling around and I tripped over the guy. So I got him up, and I couldn't get back out Billy's room. I didn't know where the stairs were. I finally found the stairs, dragging him, and then I hear a couple of guys coming up the stairs. So I hollered at them, you gotta give me a hand. I didn't have a mask on. They had their masks and they had a line to mm -hmm. get the room fire. So they ended up grabbing the guy and they got us outside anyways. They did, thank God. No. Huh? Um, what was that feeling like, um, Ed, to go into smoke like that and have your breath taken away or? Well, I don't know, when you're going in, if you can't see the flame, it, it probably don't bother you much, but if you can see the flame, you're saying to yourself, what am I doing going in here? You know, I mean, you just get the feeling, I'd like to get home to my family, you know, what am I doing running in here? Everybody else is running out, but you gotta do what you gotta do, you know? Mm -hmm. 
and after a while you got an idea what you're gonna be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you're going in to find somebody, you gotta go in and see if you can find them, you know. Jerry, uh, Jerry Gaynor, Freddie Dodd and myself were working in Jafar. We got the call to Pine Street to the house fire and there's fire coming out the upstairs floor. There's two family house. So I don't know. Everything happened so fast, you just told him, somebody yelled kids in there. Oh. So, uh, the old booster, Freddie and I took off and went up the stairs and everything. We got up the upstairs apartment, so and there was three kids we took out of there. Jerry took, to, took, took a kid and her mother, I think, out of the first floor. But we got the, we got the kids out. Three o'clock in the morning, the phone rings, and the guy down on Wind Street, the main station, but answers the phone. And the guy in East Woburn and Central Square just pick up the phone, listen. And uh, there's a house fire in North Woburn near the Wilmington line. And I'm all alone in the truck, because they didn't have a replacement. If your had to call in sick or something, they didn't have a replacement. So I had to go up there all alone. All I could see was flames coming up through the air in the sky. And I get up to North Woburn and uh, Dick Bennett and, and uh, Al Matrano were there, two cops. Mm -hmm. Blew them both well, and they both helped me out. Got the, got the people out of the house, and one of them got the hose on the hydrant for me and all that stuff, so we could, you know, we, they helped me. And you know, I really appreciate it, because the main thing is you get the people out of the house, and you know, sometimes you don't save the house, but you do the best you can, you know, so. My toughest fire uh, when I was a firefighter was uh, the night we had the Hanson house over on uh, Cambridge Road, and I was first into that. Uh, Bob McGeehan, Bobby Ingraham, myself were in Engine 5, and uh, on the way we got the call there was three kids trapped in the second floor. Mm -hmm. And we pulled up and there was heavy smoke coming out of the second floor windows in the first floor on the left, I remember. And somebody had come along before we got there and put a wooden ladder up to the second floor window. And Bob McGann and I went up the ladder, and the ladder broke and dumped us into the hedges. And it was, it was a strange situation because it was a garrison, and when you went in the front door, when the front door closed, it closed off where the stairwell was. So we had a hard time getting up the stairs. And finally we went around through a ladder, and I went in through a window on the side, and I found a little seven-year-old laying on the top of the stairs. Uh, past her, I think it was Wally Larson. Uh, and then McGannon took one side of the hallway and I took the other side of the hallway because we were still looking for the other two kids and we couldn't find anybody. So we finally hauled out, McGann hauled out the front window to the chief, uh, you know, we've searched up there and we can't find it. Well, the father had dropped the two kids out the back of the house, out the window, and they were, they were safe. Oh, but that wow. little girl, you know, she was only seven years old. And, and she that, passed. And she passed away. And that was a tough situation for me. Yeah. That is very hard. Yeah. I don't know. How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, it's part of the job, you know. Uh, yeah. Back to the station early in the morning, and McGann sat down with me, and uh, you know, said that. And I had seen my first year on. I had three fatal fires. Oh, we you had, did. We had the uh, janitor on the uh, Plinth School that died. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a fellow the Saturday before Christmas up on uh, Garfield Avenue uh, that died, and then we had a woman over on uh, Washington Street, and they were all on my shift. So I had seen, you know, some death prior to that, but little kids bought you. When we took over the ambulance with the medical aides, that, that is what, that's what it's all about right now. It's mm -hmm. all medical. Um, there are no fires anymore other than one isolated one here right. and a six months down the road, another isolated one. And most of them don't get out of hand with the mm -hmm. sprinklers and so forth. The same for businesses also. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, smoke detectors, a tremendous, tremendous mm -hmm. improvement. Bon Shoe is probably one of the last fires downtown, don't you think? I would say. We pulled up front, Jimmy Ring and myself, and... Um, Timmy looked over and he, he says, I really can't see too much. And I says, it's full of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and Timmy goes, oh, God. So he oh, calls, yeah. calls back and they come down. And it was a horror show. God, tough to get into. You know. This basement, did it stand in the basement? Yeah, yeah. they left an iron going down the, there. The, the, the guy, me. yeah, he was a Russian and he made um, special shoes and stuff. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Special blues and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Well, that was, there was going everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere you tried to break a window and get in, and fire would come out. And we get in that back door. I think we get down six stairs and couldn't run yeah. any further. Yeah, they couldn't work and sell yeah. the fire. Yeah. The hardest thing in the world to put out to get to. Yeah, you got to get down and get in there to put it out. Yeah. You know, 
they put us in a booth right away. Clark and I were on the road, uh, uh, tower. So we just went up to the roof and all we did was chop over the chop over the chop mm. And it got worse and worse. Open up over here. Yeah. So then he had a... That was such too. a devastating drive. Right up at you. A, a guy from, it uh, stayed in Bon Chur. Never, um, got, never got to the uh, fabric place next door or any other building. How did you ever stop it from going across the way? Or? Years ago they built the buildings with fire stops. Yeah. It, had, it had a brick wall. Firewall. Firewall all the way up, oh, yeah. up to the roof. We would beat. I mean, you, you can... Really wear yourself out. Oh, I should think so. Lugging yeah. the hoses, did the water, and everything. It's got to be back for yeah. more. Timmy Ring at that fire almost got almost got seriously injured. Oh, really? Yeah. And How did he, that happen, Joe? I believe he almost got trapped in the basement. Really? And, yeah. But um, fortunately for him, he got out. He lost his helmet. The helmet got destroyed, and um, he was very, very lucky from what I heard or what we heard when we were down mm -hmm. there. And then when we got back, we heard more of the information. But that was a Probably you're right, one of the biggest fires that we've had other than the Recent, Bradco, yeah, kind of Bradco building. The fire would bring everybody together and it, to me it always made the camaraderie a lot better. Oh, everybody got along and everybody was, it was like you won the game after the, the event was over. It was like, the, you know, an event and uh, it, was it an just event. made everybody together. Those days we had hose had to be hung after a fire. You laid the line down the street, charged the line, we took it back to station three, the trucks would go back there with all the hose, whether it was good weather or bad weather. For winter time, the hose would be frozen ice. You'd have to get a track, truck to, uh, pickup truck to lay it in that because you couldn't roll it and put it into uh, back on the back step right. of the uh, engines. But we'd take it to Central Square and we'd uh, buck up or flip a coin to see who was gonna go up to the top of the hose tower which was about 40 feet up, antiquated old system that you had to go up and kick a plank along each wall, kitty the wall. Hard to believe. Yeah. So one guy would go up. In fact, Bill Gay, who uh, was a mentor of mine also, uh, fell out of the tower one time. Uh oh. Believe it or not, the hose was piled at the bottom of the tire, tower, and he fell into the hose and was protected from. He he broke some bones, but he he should have been killed actually. Mm. But anyways, you'd hang the hose. That was another event that, that uh, brought all the guys together. I, I had a crazy crew. My, my crew, when I became captain, my crew was known as Mouse Bulls, all right? And uh, they all had the sweatshirts, and they were all bulls. You bought the sweatshirts. Blue and Eddie. You bought them. Yeah, I bought the sweatshirts. Yeah. Right. And Eddie was a bull. He could go on fire. I didn't have to worry about Eddie. If the wall had to be knocked down, Eddie would, if he couldn't do it with the axe, he'd do it with his body. He'd knock it down some way. Whatever had to be done, the furniture had to be moved. Eddie could pick up a chair like that and throw it out the window. And, yeah. Yeah, I was working in engine three, and it was uh, myself, Pat Pappas, uh, Jimmy McManus, uh, Joe Dooley, and, uh, and Billy Tedesco we were working there. So uh, it was nighttime, and I laid down, I went to sleep. And, Somebody hit the bell, and I jumped up, and I, my night hitch was right next to the bed. I pulled a night hitch. I just couldn't get this night hitch up, and I, I says, I can't waste time here. So I just went down the pole with nothing on, just my boots. And they're laughing like blazes. And they had taken my night, come in and taken my night hitch out and put Pat Pappas, who's the smallest guy there, his in. And... Needless to say, I, I, I laughed too afterwards. I laughed, you know. But, it was uh, a false alarm, though. Oh, they were just ringing the bell themselves in the, in the station, you know. They just wanted to see if I could get it on. <laughs> Pat says, it's a good thing you didn't rip them. It's the only pure I got. <laughs> so, yeah. How about Bill Moran? The bull? <laughs> he was no, Don't get near him if he has <laughs> an axe. <laughs> yeah. He has an axe? That's his he nickname, was, the bull. I'll tell you, he, was, we, he was active. We had a fire up in Robin Lee Circle there. And it was kind of like a, a duplex. So I was up one side, and they, they just say, we're making it into a, a, a two family or something. And all they had was plasterboard, uh, you know, no paint and no plaster or nothing yet there. And I was with uh, blind Billy Moran, and Billy, he was on call. And he says, watch out. He says, the bull's on the other side of that wall. The next thing we know, uh, the, the, the axe comes right through the wall for no reason, you know. 
Jesus, you know. I mean, I was like five feet away, but you know, it's funny. Uh, the other Billy once says, he, "Watch out for him. He's got an axe." Yeah. Sure enough, because I think he was still a firefighter then. Billy, he ended up being a captain too. But, yeah, geez. but he was fearless that way. Oh, he was nuts. Yeah. He, he'd want the bell hit, hit, hit. You know, he'd want to go to a fire. Let's go. Let's go. We got to do something here, right? Gina, tell me something about Jerry Gina. I haven't heard many. Crazy. Of Oh. <laughs> he never bought gear. We had to buy our own gear. Yes. So he never bought gear in his life. And anybody's gear that was down there, that would, he'd just grab someone's gear and put it on. Yeah. You'd come in that night and go, what the hell, how am I coming on? This stuff is all wet. <laughs> he's just soaking wet, you know? I mean, uh, he was a character. Oh, uh, he's. Good he, firefighter, also. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He well, was a, a hot ticket. You know, you, you, can't, you can't fault him for much. I mean, he had a heart of gold. No. Yeah, I, I'll tell you a story about Brooklyn and Billy, you, you remember this because it was on your street there, Church Street there, whatever it is. And uh, Gerard Gain <clears throat> uh, was on, and I think I was with you on the ladder. Neil Booker and came over on the pump and Billy and it was Ingraham and uh, Ingraham and Booker. Booker. Yeah. And I, I must have been on overtime working on your shift there. And uh, they get to the fire and it was a, a mattress fire. So they haul the mattress outside, and you know, look at them. Uh, they go upstairs, look around, and he goes, uh, "Jerry," he says, uh, "Where did they get the mattress?" You know, <laughs> Booker got a cigar oh, and yeah, was... like this, his hat sideways, and uh, Jerry says, "Where the hell do you think they got it? Sears and Moba." <laughs> <laughs> he meant, "What bomb did they get it yeah. out?" You know, <laughs> Jesus, he was. Uh. I went to one, and we're coming down through the square, and the hose on the Matterdales, they call them now, is sideways on right behind, go from left to right. And we just put new hose on engine three, and they're slippery when they're new. And I got the side wing going, look, Bobby Farrell, I said, Jesus, I said, this, what the hell's happening here? I said, everybody's getting out of my way, and the, the hose is flipping down the back of me. I hit three cars. <laughs> Holy Jesus. I said, oh my God. I said, that's right. Someone Pope finally uh, told us, you know, they're blinking. Like, what the hell? They're blinking their lights at it. He says, that's great, you know. How about putting the first sale signs on Walter? The Walter's Walter's They used cow. to torture poor Walter. All, all Walter Fiend, was an old bachelor, I heard. Yeah, and they used oh. to torture him, too. You know? mm. Walter was a very particular man in the way he did things, well, especially yeah. about his house. And I remember with Joey McDonald oh. one time in the fire truck, and Joey says to me, right after a snowstorm, he says, stop here yeah. on um, Ella Street. And he says, i got to go in Walter's yard and put my footprints in. Oh, yeah. And he'd walk in and he'd go up to under a window, and then yeah. he'd go all the way back in the footprints yeah. and walk. And Walter would come home, and oh, he'd be beside himself. <laughs> Who's been in my house? What been they he used to leave his car in the yard. So we'd think people were home. He bought two cars, so we'd have one in the yard yeah, all they, the time. When he'd come out of the house, he'd walk backwards. <laughs> so they think he was going in the house. See? <laughs> you think he wasn't stupid. He said, what the hell is he doing? You know? uh, uh, he, he, he was a... He was, a good guy. he was the life of the place, so really. He was a good guy. We had uh, a smoke bomb one time. We tossed it in the, <laughs> tossed it in the uh, where the boiler was, you know, the little room in there. Holy Jesus, there's a fire. Come on, come on, let's get the whole water here. You grab the nozzle, we'll go turn on the pump and everything. He's in there. Where's the water? Where's the water? Oh my God. I mean, oh Christ. <laughs> there's more things. I, I, I'm telling you. It's, Did he take it well? Oh, he'd get mad, a little bit mad. I put a rock underneath his tire once. And uh, he couldn't back up. And walked your transmission's gone. I said, I can repair it. Give me 50 bucks, I can repair it, you know. Oh, I mean, it, it's little simple things like that, you know, and it gave me the money. He said, geez, Billy, I don't have 50. I got 10. Well, give me the 10 now. You owe me 40. I'll see you tomorrow. I pulled out the rock. Try it now, Walter. <laughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> then you give him back the money, you know. I mean, it's... <laughs> I don't know if I did or not. Probably not. <laughs> uh, the fire department's like another family because you spend so much time with them. So you get very... Uh, uh, they're, they're the, the people that you see, you know, the other the other time, the shift that you're away from home. They're part of your life. They're part of your life. You, you, you're in the station with them, you, you live in there with them, you eat your, your meals with them, you, you sleep at night with them, you know. So you, they're quite a part, and they become part of your life, you know. Group 1 was working on July 6th in 2002, and about 12.30 at night, 
the alarm came in for a uh, building fire at 8 Monville Avenue, right out of Woburn Square. On the bottom two floors of the uh, Monville Avenue, there was a, the Woburn Cleaners was on the left, and to the right of it was the uh, a Mexican restaurant. I was on Tower 2 that night, coming from North Woburn. First arriving apparatus at the scene, they, they quickly struck a second and then a third alarm, which brought all of Woburn apparatus to the scene, plus additional outside coverage from other cities and towns. I was coming from North Woburn that night and assigned to Tower 2. We were directed as we come down to Main Street to proceed up to the Walnut Street parking lot behind the Woburn Cleaners in the Boulder Dome and to back over to the fire scene. At that time, I was directed by Ca uh, Captain Kenton. He told me to put the tower up and we were going to put a, a curtain of water on the back of the building, try to uh, knock the fire down from that end. I remember uh, it was a very warm night and the you know, Reading uh, engine came up to the parking lot. They tied the hydrant over by the VFW and they backed the line over to us and fed us our water supply. Uh, initially, they try to get inside the building and make an interior attack. There's a firefighter there, it looks like it's Captain Farrell. He's attempting to, to break the glass with a long pipe pole to smash it. That's strictly to, to ventilate, to get the smoke out so that the firefighters would be able to get in there. They knew that it was all in the back of the building. They also didn't know how far it had extended into the apartment, which was above there. Between the Mexican restaurant and the Wuben cleaners, there was an exterior door that gave them access to the second floor. The firefighters went into that, up through that door, up the stairways to try to make an attack up there. But at that time, the heat was so tremendous that they were driven back. However, on the alley facing uh, east of the uh, Mexican restaurant, they did attempt several times to get through the windows above there just to ventilate, to get the smoke and the heat out. The fire at that time had extended out to the back and up, up the back side of the, um, of the building. Uh, there was a lot of fire on, on one side and mostly smoke uh, on the other side. We were told afterwards that they, they believed it might have been started from the, there was a large vent that came outside of the back of the Mexican restaurant and proceeded up, up to the uh, outside of the building and that the, the vent itself probably caused the fire an over-accumulation of grease in the vent. We were there the whole night. The, the fire, if most of the main fire was knocked down within an hour and a half to two hours, but there was smoldering, smoldering embers in, in different parts of the building that was, went all during the night. Bob Perry was the senior captain. Mm -hmm. He had been a captain from probably the 50s. So he had a lot of experience. He was the senior captain. Mm -hmm. and he, did, he did a great job. The uh, Dr. Glenn Fire Station uh, was built under Bob Perry's when he was uh, chief of department. Um, he was uh, instrumental in implementing the smoke detector laws. One of my goals when I became chief was to, uh, to replace the equipment because we're still, this was 1982, we had three of the 1966 uh, or 67 GMCs. We had a 75 uh, Maxim ladder truck, and my goal was to replace that equipment. So in 1983, uh, Jack Rabbit was mayor at the time, and we bought our first engine to replace engine floor in East Woburn. In 86, we bought our second engine, uh, which went over the west side, engine five. Uh, then we replaced um, engine three in Central Square in the late 80s. Uh, at that time, we were into the hazmat, so the mayor allowed, allowed me to buy a hazmat truck, to, which we fully equipped and went up in North Woburn. And I went on in 69, so 69 into the late 70s, mm -hmm. all through the 70s, uh, there wasn't the smoke detectors. Uh, there wasn't the fire prevention that they have now. Even in the um, industrial buildings, didn't have the inspections that they pull on them now all the time to make sure mm -hmm. everything is up to code. Joe, myself, and eight, there was seven or eight other firefighters took the first uh, EM, EMT course in Woburn. Oh, really? And back in 19... I forget the date now. Uh, I would say probably it was around 75. 
because we took the ambulance over in 1976, mm -hmm. and they were able to take it over because they had sufficient EMTs in the fire department who would be able to man the ambulance. Mm -hmm. We inherited the ambulance from the police department. It was an old Cadillac, was it? No, it was an old International. International. It was like a hearse, all right? Had no radio, had a, uh, a bungee cord holding the back door closed, and a portable hanging out the window. <laughs> and it was, I was one of the first ones to sign to it. Yeah. All by yourself. When I met Chief Callahan and he offered me the job and I accepted, he handed me a, a leather helmet. And uh, I still have that helmet to this day. I still use that helmet to this day. Uh, Arthur Pepe gave me a used, torn, plastic, what amounted to a raincoat. Someone else, I think it was Fred Dowd, gave me a pair of used hip boots. And that's all they were. They didn't have a steel shank in the, in the sole. They didn't have steel toes. Um, and then I think I was sent to Marum's down in Wuben Center to get um, polyester, polyester blend pants or, or whatever. That's what you wore. You know, this isn't a Wuben thing. This was an industry-wide thing. And uh, garden gloves, essentially, is what you wore in your hands. And... Uh, and good luck. And good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck. There you go. That's we it. thought we thought that was great, but I mean that's what everybody wore at that time. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Today, on the other hand, the department supplies all the clothes, and um, it's all fire retardant from the station wear to the the turnout gear is now uh, an ensemble. It, it's uh, uh, low cut boots with steel shanks and steel toes. Uh, Nomex are the equivalent. Um, uh, trousers and, and, and firefighting coat. Uh, Nomex is a, a fire resistant um, material mm -hmm. so that it won't burn. And uh, they're equipped with vapor barriers that um, protect the firefighter from heat, um, which also serve to heat up his body temperature. So it, it does cause him some discomfort in certain instances. Uh, the you have the hazmat material now too that you deal with, right? And you d in that when you do, do go into a chemical fire, you have special equipment to handle when you know you're going into a chemical fire? That's been an evolution. That was coming about um, probably in the 80s. And we did go to a hazmat response type situation at that time. Do you think that most of the calls now that you get are medical response calls? Medical aid calls have grown uh, pretty much every year to the point where they're probably better than 60% of our calls today. Uh, in numbers, somewhere over 3,000 transports a year. Um, can I ask you, um, Steve, what did, it, what did it mean to you to be a firefighter? Do you think you made a difference? When I look back at it, it was the best thing I ever did because I grew to like the job very much. And then when I retired, I did feel as though I did some good, you know. You know, it wasn't for naught. I was very happy I did it, you know. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about it, I mean, basically. Yeah. Just from what I knew from her. But, but uh, no, very, very happy I did it. Wonderful. How about you, Jack? I found the job very rewarding as I look back at it. Uh, because there were, you know, sad times, like I say, when children get hurt or something, you know, or someone gets killed. Uh, these are the bad times, but, you know, if, if you get a fire and you knock it down quick and you save a house, uh, or, you know, or help someone out of a jam, it's, it's very rewarding as I look back at it. And uh, I wasn't sure I wanted, I took it at, uh, the exam uh, when Lonnie Finn got out of service. He's gone, let's take the fire down. I've done very little studying, but uh, I made it. And, uh, you know, I, like I say, I, I, 33 years I had on it, it's very rewarding, you know. I know my family enjoyed it. My my son Chris tells me, you know, I didn't, you didn't tell me he was at this fire, yeah. you know. And other people that's on with him now, they ask him this and ask him, well, if I, he says, you know, he never talked about the job, you know. But I, I had eight children, so I had to always be working in time to talk about the job unless I was on the job, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Bill? Well, like, like I both said, you know, it's very rewarding, and it's... People thank you and everything, you know? I mean, I mean, it's... That makes it right there, you know, and when you 
help someone out or try and save someone and pull someone out of a house coffin and everything. I mean, that's the great part of the job, you know, and that, that's what you're in it for, really. Mm -hmm. You know, to protect people and hey, that's, what else can I add to it? I, ju I just can say, I, I did 37 years, I loved every day of it. Mm -hmm. And my wife can tell you that I never brought the job home, or if I did, it was something happened to City Hall, not on the fire department. <laughs> no, I, I, I loved the job. It was a great career for me. Uh, my son has followed in my so footsteps, my son David. Mm -hmm. Most gratifying, I think, was I got a call up in uh, Webster Avenue for a child uh, drowning in a tub. Mm -hmm. So I went up there, and apparently the mother put the Two children, one of the older one was probably two, two and a half years old, and the younger one was probably three or four months old. So I got the call, a baby drowning. So I got there, and she rushed out with the baby, with her, put in my arms. I started CPR on the, on the baby. He was out of it completely, and uh, Jimmy Murphy was on a cruiser. He says, jump in. So I jumped in the cruiser. I'd done mouth to mouth all the way up to the hospital. And just as I'm walking to the hospital door, the baby came too. That was the most gratifying to me. Just it's being fine. able to help help people out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you got a lot of medical aids, which we get now, of course, like we were saying earlier. And you, it could be anywhere from a heart to cardiac arrest until somebody that just has fallen out of bed. Uh, you get them back in bed, you get them back into their chair. Mm -hmm. um, doing something for people, I guess, is what firefighting is all about. Um, they're there to help um, uh, countless things go on that, uh, you know, going to somebody's house just to um, move a piece of furniture because something isn't right, you know, they can't get their wheelchair in or something, so they call the fire department. People call the fire department for a lot of weird things that nobody has any idea or they wouldn't think of doing, but people that think to do it, do it, and they get results. Uh, we, we never not go out and help somebody out with whatever their problem is. I'll tell you one thing, the, the department, the service of the fire, the fire service has changed over the years mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, new laws and everything, the construction, we aren't getting the fires we got. But the job is still one of you working to take care of the people when they have a problem. And I take my hats off to the guys on the job today with that ambulance service and with the incidents they get involved in. Boy, they, they're on the ball, yeah, and I take my wonderful. hat off to them. Yeah, yeah, we thought we were great when we went in and ate some smoke, but they're great, too. Ed, uh, did you like being a firefighter? Yes, I did. Missed it very well. You did? Yes. And do you, do you feel that uh, what, you made a difference being a firefighter? No, I was just one of the guys. He is so easygoing. He's unbelievable. He, he made a difference. The big thing, it... it when I'm a captain anyway, I try to tell all the guys is, look, we work, we, our boss is the people of Wuben. We work for the people of Wuben. And whatever we could do, we, we did to take care of them. We did a lot of crazy things too, you know, helping people out. You know, it wasn't fire lines or anything, just a person who had a problem, they called the fire department, you went and you took care of them, whatever the problem was. Did you enjoy it? Oh, I enjoyed it, yeah. You yeah. liked being a firefighter? Oh, yeah, it, was, it worked out good. Yeah? Yeah. The, the guys today are just as terrific as the guys were back then. They're different. Everybody's different. So um, with the guys back then, with the, the hard-nosed, uh, greatest generation type guys, the guys today are more diverse and more technological, technologically sav savvy and, and, in reality, better educated than um, um, the drive to help people is still there. It's the same. When you, when you take the job, it's it just the type of person who takes the job. I, I used to enjoy going to work, you know, because you never knew what was going on, or what was going to go on, you know. But I enjoyed going to work, and I enjoyed the guys I worked with. Yeah, like I say, you had your you had your sad moments, but you had your your fun. Even at fires, you could you'd have fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you made it what you could make it. You know, there's no sense getting all bent out of shape about it. You know. Yeah. But the other thing was knowing that the guys you're working with are going to back you up. Whatever, whatever was going down, everybody they look out, make sure that everybody was 
going to be safe. Everybody will get home. You know? Right, absolutely. Very satisfying career. I'm very pleased with how the last 38 years have turned out. Uh, I enjoyed it. I made a lot of friends. Um, a lot of different in, uh, incidents and calls that I that I remember that have um, some I'd rather not remember, but some that I always that I try to remember the good ones, right. the better calls we had. Right. So, do you think all your thirty some odd years, um, how it affected people, made a difference to a lot of people? I, I would like to think so. Right. Mm -hmm. It seemed rewarding to have helped so many people over the years. You know, mm -hmm. it uh, makes you feel good. You know, it yeah. should. I will never forget. I was with driving Joe Haley. We were down to Miller's place off Fall Street. In the, in the back of the three deckers, there was a uh, iron catwalk that came, came from one, one building to the other. And uh, I, I had thrown a ladder. There, there was a kitchen fire on the third floor. <coughs> and I had just thrown a ladder up. And I'm halfway up the ladder, and the, the railings here on the ladder just made touch touching the, the, the steel grating. And uh, I'm up there, halfway up, and a young young girl came out the kitchen window, ro ro rolled to the uh, fire escape hole, and, and passed me on the way down. Oh, that must have been hard to see, Bob. Tragic. Mm -hmm. Look at the difference you've made, Bob, you know, being a firefighter all these years. Don't you think you've made a great difference? Yeah, we saved a lot of people. Couldn't save her. It takes a special kind of person to do what they do. They can be common and ordinary people in many ways, but they do some uncommon and extraordinary things. They put on that uniform and they pledge to help you and I, and then they go out and do their best. The shifts turn into weeks, the weeks into years, and the years into a career. But in the end, each one of them can look back and know that they've made a difference. For far beyond being merely ever ready, they've been ever faithful. Faithful to that pledge they took, faithful to each other, and faithful to their own internal compass that no matter what the situation, always steered them on that noble and honorable path of helping others. And for that, the city of Woburn and all those who have ever called Woburn their home can be forever grateful. <laughs>